This is the Very Not Normal podcast with me, your host, Frida Beisel, and this is episode 10 on transhumanism. Transhumanism, a very, very loaded topic. Until recently, I knew very little about transhumanism. I only had passing knowledge of it. It existed in the periphery for me in the way that genres that I'm not interested in, that are not my cup of tea, exist for me. Like, say, magic, surrealism, horror. I especially don't like horror. And science fiction. I am not a fan of the entire science fiction fantasy genre. I don't read or watch really on it, but for the occasional Black Mirror or Simpsons episode. So transhumanism was there with the wonky things that I knew in the side of my head, mixed up with words like incantation, spells, and wands. And that was about that. Recently, as I have been thinking a lot about this question of the Technic Society, and I promise you that I'm not going to do all my podcast episodes about this particular subject. It's just my area of interest at the moment. But I've been thinking about it a lot, and a part of that has led me sort of to rethink transhumanism. What the fuck is actually transhumanism? It is a real life concept. It is a huge umbrella and it has all of these wonky and cuckoo and fascinating and seriously consequential ideas within it that I am thinking now are the underpinning ideology of the Technic Society. So today I want to work out a little bit what's in my head on transhumanism in my podcast episode. So please indulge me. Transhumanism is the large umbrella of different ways that people believe that technology is going to improve the human condition, help humans evolve in a direction that will enhance our lives and help us as a species survive, as well as all the ideas that see humans as potentially becoming so much smarter, more efficient, more beautiful, more perfect, more healthy, and more advanced, that is to say with partial or complete integration with machines, to propel ourselves as a species to a whole new landscape, in fact, to even solve death. Transhumanism at its apex is the promise of the perfect utopian life that is immortal and without suffering. Before I talk about my own way of interpreting all this, I want to try to be a little neutral as I give you concrete examples of what the transhumanist ideology is comprised of. There are some very popular specific ideas in which huge amounts of money have been invested in order to try to bring these ambitions to fruition. And in order to give you a little taste of that, I'm going to read to you from Lifeboat, a website that is also somehow related to the transhumanist agenda. And there I found a blog post with a top 10 transhumanist projects, and I will read it to you starting from number 10. Cryonics. Cryonics is a high fidelity preservation of the human body and particularly the brain after what we call death, in anticipation of possible future revivals. In other words, cryonics is freezing a body, and the transhumanist ambition is to revive the body eventually. Virtual reality, simulation will become the preferred environment for work and play. Pretty soon, the main obstacle to truly immersive VR will not be the visuals, but the haptics, our sense of touch. To fool our senses into believing haptic technologies are conveying the real thing, the frame rate needs to be significantly higher than for visual technologies. In other words, the ambition is for virtual reality to become completely synonymous or to be as gratifying as physical reality. Eight is gene therapy. 
gene therapy. Gene therapy replaces bad genes with good genes, and RNA interface can selectively knock out gene impressions. Together, they give us an unprecedented ability to manipulate our own genetic code. Space colonization is number seven. Space colonies will become necessary to house the many billions of individuals that will be born in the future as our population continues to expand at a lazy exponential. As an aside, the entire subject of overpopulation is also something that I sort of vaguely know pieces of, and I know that it is a very big subject of interest in the sort of Silicon Valley crowd. Space colonization, I suppose, is the answer to that existential angst, and I think overpopulation and eugenics are a whole different subject that one day I really will need to read up about. But that's another day. Six is cybernetic. Cybernetic systems will greatly improve our everyday experience from letting us hear a wider range of ambient sounds to viewing millions of stars rather than just a few thousand to making us more resistant to accidents. They will improve the overall economy by enabling us to do more work in less time for better pay. In the long term, enhanced humans may get a bigger portion of the economic pie than unaugmented humans. So this is the ethical quandary. Okay, moving on. Number five, autonomous self-replicating robots. <laughs> Why do manual labor when the robots can do it for you? Self-replicating, okay, I think this is self-explanatory. You know what the self-replicating robots are. They make other robots of themselves. And a landmark NASA study, advanced automation for space missions, found the robotic self-replication is just a matter of engineering and that no fundamental theoretical breakthroughs are needed. Number four, molecular manufacturing. If self-replication is the holy grail of robotics, then molecular nanotechnology, MNT, is the holy grail of manufacturing. Molecular nanotechnology would use a massive array of nanometer scale actuators, actuators, I don't know, I have no idea how you pronounce this, to manufacture macro scale products with atomic precision. Concept is nanofactory. In practical terms, the creation of nanofactories would mean that practically everything could be made out of a diamond. Motors would become so powerful that a cubic centimeter would provide enough torque to propel a car. Medical nanodevices could heal wounds and repair organs without the need for surgery. And air-suspended nanodevices, utility fog, could be configured to stimulate practically any desired object on demand. Number three, megascale engineering. Megascale engineering refers to building structures at least 1,000 kilometers in length in one dimension, such as a space elevator, global casses, or Dyson sphere. With a self-replicating robotics above, the production of such large structures could be done largely by autonomous drones. Number two, mind uploading. Mind uploading, sometimes referred to as nanobiological intelligence, centers around the controversial proposition that cognitive processing can be implemented on substratus other than our current neurons. In other words, our brain activity can be transferred onto computer bytes, O's and ones. It appears that our minds are defined more by the information pattern they embody than the particular hardware they are implemented on. And here the term hardware is used as synonymous with a brain, I suppose. And further on they say, People don't want to think that they're just data structure being implemented as computational automata on biological neurons, but it is hard to think of it any other way. Once we dismiss the possibility of an immaterial soul, we must acknowledge the mind as a material pattern implemented in physical configurations, and if other substances aside from our current neurons can meet the requirements for these configurations, then there is no reason why intelligence and consciousness could not exist on another substrate. In other words, what they are talking about now is the fundamental philosophical question, what is the mind? And the material position, which underlies transhumanism, is that our mind are simply the activity of our brains, and if you move the activity onto a synthetic surface, then you can replicate the brain. And the number one they have, the final one, is artificial general intelligence. And they say that it is strongly likely that AI is possible. Thinking, feeling, imagining, creating, communicating through synthetic intelligence with conscious experience. Okay, 
I read to you the 10 most ambitious projects of transhumanism, and then I took a five minute break for a car outside my window to honk, five consecutive minutes of honking. And I think I'm finally rid of that and I'm back. So all of these big, huge ideas, we're gonna live forever, we're gonna unfreeze ourselves in 500 years, we're going to feel no pain, we're gonna be smarter and more beautiful, and you have no idea we will feel things that we could never imagine. Okay, great. Transhumanism itself is not just these movie-esque concepts. We might argue that the here now is transhumanistic. The entire response to COVID-19 has been fairly transhumanist. It has been the artificial technological avenue instead of relying on the natural avenue. Because transhumanism involves any technology that enhances human existence. In fact, the Wall Street Journal ran an article titled Looking forward to the end of humanity, COVID-19 has spotlighted the promise and peril of transhumanism, the idea of using technology to overcome sickness, aging, and death. And I think indeed, COVID-19 has brought transhumanism into our lives more and more. We still can't live forever. We're not adding on to ourselves some synthetic arms and limbs, but we are now thinking differently and we are responding to life's challenges differently based on the transhumanist ambitions. That is the part that I am interested in. The part that is about, I don't know, living in the cloud for eternity is, how should I put this in a way that will um, sound, I don't know. Um, I, I think it is, unhinged and pretty um, ridiculous and I don't know, should I tell you how I really feel? There are so many problems with all of these ambitious projects which rest on the flimsiest of ideas and seem to confuse what is doable in movies with what we have any indication of being doable in the world and which also seems to think that just because some technologies were invented in the past, therefore all of the transhumanist things will happen in the future. And it's a little like a little kid in his cardboard box convinced that it is going to fly. And you know, I'm not going to argue with that little kid, the box is not going to fly. But all of these ideas are sort of so ingrained in our conversation and there's so much burden of proof on those who think it is absurd. It is like the religious who say, proof to me that Tchisa Maisim can't happen. Tchisa Maisim is the Jewish version of cryogenics or cryonics. Tchisa Maisim is the return of the dead to life. Prove to me that this little cardboard box I'm sitting in won't fly. You know what, honey? I'm not going to argue with you. It is fine with me if you think the box is going to fly. And yes, maybe one day it could fly, but really I am going to bet on it not flying. The arguments in the mind uploading part are just insulting because they say, if you agree that there is no spirit, then you must concede that it automatically follows that if there is no spirit, then the mind is uploadable to a computer. Wait, no, why? How do you know that just because it is not A, then it equals G? How does that prove one prove the other? And they sneak in a little emotional manipulation by saying people don't want to imagine themselves as mere constructs of hardware and software, i.e. People are biased. They don't want to face the rational, real reality, says the people who just said so-called death. There were so many clowns in the transhumanist party. Well, actually, there is in the United States actually a transhumanist party. And apparently some guy ran for president on the transhumanist ticket and he rode around in a coffin-shaped bus, which he called the immortality bus. 
And then I read about a guy who would show up in front of Google's office every day with a sign demanding Google solve death, because as you are well aware, Google can solve death if only it stopped spending on Pringles for its employees and focused on the real deal. And yesterday I read about this extremely wealthy, I think they were all extremely wealthy and almost out of problems and making problems because their lives are boring. But this multi-million dollar pharmaceutical executive, Martina Rothblatt, who seems to have a whole kind of religious-esque thing going with transhumanism. Rothblatt, like many of these characters, I almost said clowns, thank goodness I stopped myself. But Rothblatt, she already has a whole vocabulary and she is ironing out the kinks of her soon-to-be Theresa Meissen. And she is packing her bags for the immortality bus. And she calls mind uploading mindware. Get it? Software? Ah, yes. Mindware. And in an article with her, she goes into details and it's just fantastical the things that she says it's just where do you come up with this and what is this even supposed to mean and how is this connected to anything that is doable here here in an article they say if anyone is going to persuade us to abandon the flesh be downloaded and live forever as information it is martina rothblatt rothblatt says there will be human error and computer glitches there will always be error in the flesh people have odd experience with their own biochemistry that makes them who they are somatically induced or inherited uploading will have its errors manageable errors and that is part of the things that will keep the uploading human no honey computer glitches bugs are not the way you keep things human i am so sorry to break it to you we are not yet following you on the immortality bus and here's more plans for your mindware soon to come. People don't need to be in one place or one machine, she explained. People can exist in many places and float. Float, okay. We shall we shall procure hand tubes ASAP. Also, also so you know before you hop on the bus that there's gonna be an option to experience life analog or digital. Um we got that one worked out. Here are more details. It's not a one-size-fits-all thing. Some people would use uploading just for storage. What would they store? Okay. Other people would want to stay digital. Some people would want to move back and forth. The first person to visit Mercury will do so uploaded into hardware that can survive that environment. For sure. Some people would use it to do certain things and then return to the flesh. It isn't necessarily an all-or-nothing thing. And that's one of the things that demonstrates the humanity of the whole project. Yeah, okay. Further on the humanity, she has evolved a visionary idea she calls transbeminism, beminism, B-E-M-A-N-I-S-M, -E a philosophy that supports transitioning to view of ourselves as unique patterns of thoughts, BEMS, beams, rather than as bodies per se, and consequently accepting of a one mind, many instantiations society. One mind, many instantiations. Let me push my glasses up to my face so I can understand this. How the hell are humans compatible with one mind, many instantiations? What are you talking about? One mind, many instantiations. Just, just hocus pocus words. When you hear words that sound fancy, don't fall for them. They are supposed to make you be impressed. It doesn't mean that they are saying anything. How can humans be many instantiations? In what world is there such a concept? What relationship does that have to anything outside of floating mercury cyborgs? All of this floaty mindware uploading, downloading singularity in the cloud language is very spiritual, flatty body up there, and it has a religious feeling. It has that feeling of the ultimate salvation and hope. 
And I say this with no disrespect for religion. I think the world is sufficiently complex and ambiguous that I respect that other people find religion to be a very large part of their worldview. But the irony is that this worldview is proposed by these so-called atheists, these extreme rationalists, these people who are pure logic, who will be very offended if you ever say they have a religion because God knows they never believe anything stupid. And they are the kinds of atheists. We know the breed. They are, whatchamacallit, they are so convinced in their belief of disbelief that it is a little dogmatic altogether anyway. I know many religious people that are extremely open-minded and many non-religious people that are as narrow as a tiny waistline. Now I'm thinking about tiny waistlines and I'm distracting myself. I wanted to talk about the religiosity of the extreme wing of transhumanism. There are very interesting stories out of this culty Silicon Valley and often they reflect both the fervency of the belief, the insularity, the conviction, and also the theological parallels to other religions. In one woman's story, she was an ex-evangelical who had planned to be a missionary for the church, and she describes herself as being drawn to transhumanism for the similarities, the loftiness of the promises. And there's also that entire part of transhumanism that is extremely male-centric, and a lot of fantasies that are about sort of dealing with male insecurities about sexual adequacy by having a woman who can never measure you up against someone else because she is factory made. All of these themes that we see in movies, Pop Culture Detective, who is a YouTube cultural critic, has a very good video called Born Sexy Yesterday in which he takes these things apart. All of these reflect that there is a lot to be cynical about with these vague things of transhumanism, which when you look up close is a lot of dogma, superstition, biases, hubris, appetite, endless appetites, a kind of gluttony, nihilism, cynicism, so much cynicism. It's just, mm -mm. <laughs> that's all I can really say. But see, I wouldn't waste a lot of time reading about these characters, or at least I try not to indulge myself because I feel like it's a red herring and I don't like to get busy with cuckoos. I feel like it's a part of our flashy culture that distracts us from the larger picture. And the larger picture of transhumanism is so much larger than those who are actively planning for the singularity. It is so much larger than asking yourself, what supplements can I take so that when my body is defrosted in the cryogenic lab, then I will be able to operate functionally. The ways in which it affects you and me and us everyday mortals who will not live to eternity are similar to the ways in which Christianity affects our culture at large. Even though I might be Jewish, we are all affected by living in a Christian nation, or at least whatever remnants of the Christian culture there is. Now I think we are much more predominantly techno-oriented. And this trickling down is the part that is relevant to me, and that is important to me, and that is alarming to me. Because without ever consenting to it, our lives are being remade within the vision that seems ideal to transhumanist ideology. I'll give you an example. Let's take virtual reality number nine on the lifeboat list. I am in no way convinced that virtual reality will ever, no matter the haptics, will ever be able to replace the physical reality because I know that we have evolved to be within physical proximity. But it is now the popular cultural zeitgeist. It is sort of the common attitude that virtual is superior. And so you'll open any newspaper, not physically, we don't do that. You visit the website and you'll find any number of articles extolling the virtues of whatever new technology. 
Take for instance, just now in the New York Times, why do I read it? I hate myself. This guy, Macron by his initials VTN, wrote an op-ed describing why he actually likes teaching on Zoom. And he says, I don't have to drive 10 minutes to university to give the lecture. I don't have to wear a blazer. I don't have to wear shoes. And plus, the resolution on his PowerPoint screen shares are much better than when the students sit in the back. Plus, he doesn't have to memorize students' names. These seem to me impoverishing, very useless gains for the loss of what you give up when you don't have in-person education. It is no comparison. In my experience, Zoom classes are a bunch of, I don't know, we look like a bunch of stoned out weirdos in front of our screens when we're sent into breakout rooms. No one talks. Who knows what the students are doing while the teacher is desperately trying to engage them. While a roundtable university class is lively and unexpected, and my memory is of just fun, a good time. But see, the core tenet of the values of the holy religion of transhumanism is innovation is good, change is good, the new is good, tried and true, hundreds of years, thousands of years of working on things and bettering them, meh. No good. And you know these fantasies about one day living in a simulation where you go in your head, like in that Black Mirror episode, San Junipero, where in your own mind you leave your body and you take on an avatar like in a video game, and you live in that avatar. I myself have gone into an avatar and have tasted the fruit of the simulated world as the video game industry offers it at the moment by having a farm in the game Stardew Valley. And my character in that world is quite successful. Her life is much better. She's more good looking. She's more energetic. She is more effective. Everything than me. And recently, Mazal Tov, I married a virtual husband there, Dr. Harvey. Yes, literally in the game, you can marry someone. And let me tell you something, these NPC characters are incredibly, incredibly dull. I think I've been married for two days and I'm already thinking of going down to Mayor Lewis's house for a divorce. It's super boring and I think the simulation games, which are now such a big industry, actually serve as a kind of fantasy rather than to actually replace anything. I think they are a more pernicious form of sort of escapism into a fantasy rather than actually being a replacement for anything. They're a lot like all the other ways we waste time to get away from our problems while our problems remain. Everything I see in virtual reality and simulation in medicine that we have now as we speak leads me to the same conclusion. There's something missing. The techno vision brings one worldview and it hollows out. It leaves you with a dead-eyed husband, Harvey, the boring doctor, because there's just something missing when you put technology in the middle of everything, when you make technology the holy grail. For me, the most startling part of this ideology is the concept of the mind uploading and its implications. Because to upload a mind to the cloud is to say that our minds are essentially machines. And in fact, this is what transhumanists believe. For example, John Haugeland, with apologies if I'm mispronouncing his name, said, what are minds? What is thinking? What sets people apart in all the known universe? Such questions have tantalized philosophers for millennia, but scanned progress could be claimed until recently. For the current generation has seen a sudden and brilliant flowering in the philosophy and science of the mind. By now, not only psychology, but also a host of related disciplines are in the throes of a great intellectual revolution. 
and the epitome of the entire drama is artificial intelligence, the exciting new effort to make computers think. The fundamental goal of this research is not merely to mimic intelligence or produce some clever fake. Not at all. AI wants only the genuine article, machines with minds in the full and literal sense. This is not science fiction, but real science based on a theoretical conception as deep as it is daring. Namely, we are at root computers ourselves. We are at root computers ourselves. A similar sentiment is expressed by Gary Marcus in an op-ed in the New York Times, which is titled, Face It, Your Brain is a Computer. And he says, there is no reason to think that brains are exempt from the laws of computation. If the heart is a biological pump and the nose is a biological filter, the brain is a biological computer, a machine for processing information in lawful, systematic ways. This underpins the transhumanist hope that we will one day live in the cloud. Michael Graziano has a TED-Ed video. TED-Ed is a company that does these short, animated, very accessible, easy to digest videos on difficult, complex concepts. And there is a video with his ideas titled, How Close Are We to Uploading Our Minds? It starts with, Imagine a future where nobody dies. Instead, our minds are uploaded to a digital world. Are you dazzled? Are you dazzled? I don't know. This doesn't seem good to me. <laughs> I look at this and I think to myself, what the fuck? No way. <laughs> okay, but all the commenters are very excited. Some are, are professing to be going into neuroscience for the future of living in the digital world. And Graziano explains what it will take for us to get there. He says, we will have to scan the human brain, which means 86 billion neurons, 100 trillion synapses. We need the connectome. We need the neural signaling. And all of that is a lot of information. The brain, it appears, packs a concentrated, extremely dense set of information that no computer comes close to. So we need to map all of that and get it onto the cloud. So once we have all the mapping, we turn it into computer code, we put it onto a floppy disk, and we boot up the program, and voila, you are living inside a computer trapped forever. Enjoy paradise. But hey, what I am stuck on is the part where once you have all the information, you translate it into computer code. Because the question is, can you actually translate the mind into computer code? When I dipped my toe into this question, I found that this has been a hot and contested topic for the longest time. And it goes into all sorts of weeds of mathematics and philosophy and physics. And there are very strong opinions on either camp. But I think we can summarize the position of the materialist, the transhumanist, as in the lifeboat article, which is to say, if humans don't have a soul, then our minds are our brains. The brains are the hardware and the processes, the thoughts, are just the effects, the output that you're running on our operating system and they're producing all the thoughts. As I've been reading, I've read some very interesting and very compelling points that illustrate why the brain is not the same. A very basic argument is that we understand everything about computers. We know exactly how it follows step A to B to C in order to execute a function and to run a set of script. We know almost nothing about the brain and we also simply cannot define the mind. What is a mind? Is a mind a brain? Well, if you take a brain out of a body, then your mind won't work. You won't know what to think if your eyes don't see something, if your ears don't pick up the sensory information that I am transmitting now to you, then you won't have that data in your brain to stimulate great thought. And that all is simply the mind-body question. 
There is also the question of the environment. We know from feral children, children who are raised in the wild, that they grow up with damage. We know from children who are raised without physical contact that they grow up with terrible problems. And we know from people who are put into isolated rooms in the dark with sensory deprivation, where they don't see anything, they don't hear anything, that the brain starts to hallucinate. In other words, the mind malfunctions as a result of being removed from its environment, not only the brain. So what is the mind? We don't even know that. So this makes it a comparison between two contestants of which one is completely mysterious. In a very interesting column by Sandra Emmett and Sam Wang in the New York Times, they wrote about all the problems with the comparison by saying, our colleague David Linden has compared the evolutionary history of the brain to the task of building a modern car by adding parts to a 1925 Model T that never stops running. As a result, brains differ from computers in many ways, from their highly efficient use of energy to their tremendous adaptability. In fact, no matter what artificial intelligence is able to do, we don't know and we are not anywhere near knowing that we will ever be able to make operating systems think. Simulating thinking is not the same as actually thinking and we don't know that they will ever be able to think. We don't know what consciousness is. So how would we know that machines would ever be able to reach consciousness? But furthermore, the way humans process memories is not in a file in a specific location, but rather it is in some haphazard way we know that different people will remember different things and we remember partial things and our memories work in a very strange non-linear set of cause and effect where you remember suddenly a smell and a partial thing and where our memories can be sort of overwritten all of these reflect the very fundamental difference between the brain and the computer there are other very interesting ways of framing the distinctions for instance talking about blind spots because we've evolved to problem solve and to survive and reproduce to put it crudely we have some extremely irrational tendencies and we have very strong blind spots we have a very hard time seeing things objectively because we bring a lot of bias to things this is something that a computer would never have a problem with there is another very interesting article that also takes apart some of the differences. This one is in The Guardian by Matthew Cobb. It's titled, Why Your Brain is Not a Computer. He is saying, although it is often argued that particular functions are tightly localized in the brain as they are in machines, this certainty has been repeatedly challenged by new neuroatomical discoveries of unsuspected connections between brain regions or amazing examples of plasticity in which people can function normally without bits of the brain that are supposedly devoted to particular behaviors. But I think most importantly for me is that we think of our minds in computers because we think in metaphors, not because it is actually the same, but because analogies are how we communicate. We in all parts of our lives use analogies in order to be able to express something. I recently read that if you don't have words for an idea, then you can't even think it. And I think this is true. And I think this means that we have a lot of words for the parts of our brain that are similar to computers because we have a lot of metaphors. Humans communicate in metaphors all the time. And since I've been reading about this topic, I find that I use a ton of computer metaphors to describe my own mental states. I need to process or they're hacking my brain. I'm talking about attention hacking or I'm crashing. The history of a metaphor is, I think, the most illuminating part. We have relied on metaphors always to understand ourselves. Pierre Bourdieu said that the mind is a metaphor of the world of objects, which can also be turned around the world of objects around us become the metaphor through which we understand the mind. Which is to say, whatever we have is that which we are then able to use to understand things. So for instance, in our ancient days, there's the Jewish folklore of the Golem of Prague. The Golem of Prague was this creation of the Maral of Prague in Prague, Czech. 
And this story is placed at about year 1500, 1600, when the rabbi wanted to protect his Jewish community from blood libels and anti-Semitism. He therefore summoned a golem, a klutz, a statue, a stupid dummy to life, which when he was infused with the magic of life, was able to walk and talk and go out and defend the people. This golem, which seems to be a precursor to sci-fi ideas, was made of the elements of life. Fire, water, air, and earth. The fire and the water and the air were the mystical inspirations, and the golem itself was made of clay because that was the earth. Why would anyone think that you make living beings out of fire and water and earth because that's what people had around them and that they could use as a metaphor to understanding everything else. So they projected fire, the properties of fire, the properties of water, for instance, on the nature of human beings. There are so many examples of how metaphors were employed all through history the thing about metaphors is they are helpful, they are necessary, but they are limited. In order to really understand something, you actually need to study the thing itself. You can't study the comparable thing. You can't study fire and then understand how the golem lived. And so you can study a computer and understand how a brain is. There have been examples of metaphors which are very interesting. For instance, Sigmund Freud revolutionized psychoanalysis at a time that the steam engine was the dominant metaphor of the day. It was so revolutionary that you got all that power source from concentrating steam. And the expression we have today, letting off steam, comes from that, which is you had a chamber where there was a lot of steam piling up. If you didn't have a release valve, then the chamber would combust. Therefore, that was used as some lesson to learn about human nature. Freud had a lot of revolutionary ideas about the conscious and the subconscious, but one of his beliefs were that humans were like steam engines, in that we hold in things, and if we don't let it out, and to Freud the release valve was sex, if we don't have sexual release, then we can combust. So it was an idea of sort of, you always need to make sure to let out some of it or else you'll combust. But actually, we now understand that a lot of our behaviors are sort of like a muscle. So let's say I definitely found in my own experience that when I was still extremely, extremely repressed and I didn't even know how to be angry, I didn't have any anger in me. But fast forward 10 years later and I am this liberated woman and going crazy in my car because the road rage is blinding me because someone had cut in front of me and I had this realization that if I'm going to keep releasing my anger then I'm just going to keep making more and maybe the idea that you have to let it out is something you need to take in moderation. So this example of Sigmund Freud is one of many in a story of analogies that we have used in order to understand ourselves. But the metaphor is limited and it could be deeply problematic. And what I see is that we are taking a metaphor to its absurd conclusion, which is to say we treat ourselves like computers. More specifically, I think most people are able to grasp the parts of themselves that are effectively simulated in NPCs, non-player characters of video games. NPCs need to sleep. NPCs need to refill their energy bar. NPCs need to have a number of hearts in order to feel love. So my betrothed, Mr. Harvey from Stardew Valley, he was convinced to marry my character by being gifted X number of spring onions and wild horseradishes that I have been foraging all over the game map. And when I fulfilled all the numbers of executed functions to show love, Harvey agreed to marry my character. So give gift equals happy, give bad thing to Harvey, give him something he hates, give him a sap and lose points. But that's the extent an NPC can do with a relationship. And there are major problems with this. 
to take one. The other day I was playing and in the game you must be in bed at two o'clock in your virtual bed in order for you not to faint and then be picked up by the ambulance which charges you a fee for the medical service. So I was very rushed because I was still busy and it was late so I ran into another player's house to sleep. Harvey, my new virtual husband, was asleep by himself and in the morning I rushed over to see what the game would tell me for having slept in someone else's house and Harvey was on the porch and he said it was so nice to watch you sleeping so peacefully. Harvey, I'm afraid, is not quite the same as a human husband. <laughs> I think I think we just cannot capture in a program the nuances of infidelity and passive aggressive behavior and betrayal and so on. Okay, okay. What are the consequences on you or me, not on Ray Kurzweil and Martina Rothblatt or whatever transhumanist? What are the effects on ordinary fleshly creatures of the homo sapien family? What is the effect on us? Of the belief that we are actually computers. I'll tell you what, it has very, very practical consequences. For instance, all of how education is now shaped is like one big algorithm, a gamified system of scores, numbers, and broken down components for different grades, all of which equal together the student's performance. I think that the entire push by teachers to teach online comes out of this philosophy because they say, what am I? I am a programmer for little children. I am supposed to program them to read, to write out script, capital and lowercase letters. I am supposed to produce in them these measurable outcomes. And just like any other programmer, there's no reason why we can't do that remotely. If you think that it is more efficient, now that is something that we think about when we sign up our children for education. How efficient are you? And it is more innovative. Now, there is something that you are dying for. What is better than innovative? Innovation is everything, but also innovation has absolutely no relation whatsoever with psychology. It is in no way informed by years and years and years of people who were very smart throughout history. There have been very, very, very smart people who have been asking the questions of how can children best be raised to be well-adjusted, thriving, only moderately damaged people in the larger world. Innovation checks that all out with the introduction of teachers sitting at home and producing little pupils who, yeah, they can read and write, they have been effectively programmed, but there's a lot, a lot that is being left out in your very limited purview of what qualifies as a desirable outcome. Just looking at my son's creative writing has been very, very eye-opening, fascinating, because he actually learns to write in an algorithmic way, the way you would teach a program to execute a function. The teacher says, take this book of essays, pick one essay and find a rhetorical device and write a single paragraph with quotes and a description of the rhetorical device. Very easy, you get a list of rhetorical devices, you look at the single essay, a computer can actually do that. The next week, she made them do the same thing. The third week, the same thing again. Now they had three paragraphs and she said, guess what? You're going to take these three paragraphs and put them together into a single essay. Add to it an introduction, add to it a conclusion. Here is the exact ways you create an introduction. You have to include your thesis statement. You have to summarize your points. You have to, etc. Here's what you do in the conclusion. And after you followed all these steps, wow, you have an essay. It seems like a great shortcut, you send that into the teacher for grading. Super easy, feels like a hack and, and amazingly tempting for anyone who has experienced the excruciating pain of writer's block. But that essay will never capture creativity, 
insight, ingenuity, left field thinking, surprises, sarcasm, humor, the entire cocktail of what makes writing writing, what makes art art. He's learning to do something that will make things easier, but will never capture actually what writing is really about. And see, what really frustrates me is that people don't even get it. They know it. They feel it. They have an instinct that there is more, that, that maybe there are things, there are needs they have that are primal. But because there are no words, because we are hammered into our brains, again, again, efficiency, innovation, the new, the algorithm, the systematic and the breakdownable, there are no words for us to talk about it and hence for us to know it, for us to be able to validate and articulate and envision something that is more in line with our psychological makeup. Transhumanism is driving a value system that leaves me without words, without an ability to be understood. But today, I'm going to leave you on a upbeat note um, because this is episode 10. I've been very much enjoying doing the podcast. I don't know how long I will keep doing it. I have no idea, but it's been very interesting to me. And I feel very grateful to you who have been listening and especially for those who have been supporting me and just for your open-mindedness and letting me say things that I always feel a little nervous saying. So here's my little surprise for you. The New York Times has a special piece titled the perfect valentines a math formula subtitle nothing says i love you like a customizable algebraic equation isn't that a fact nothing says i love you like an algebraic equation see i think my marriage with dr harvey still has maybe hope but <laughs> meet zeus zeus is german for sweet in yiddish it's zeus Zeus is an interactive widget that allows you to tweak the algebra and customize the heart to your soul's delight. Zeus is literally an image, a 3D image of a heart, which you can change by moving three sort of levers. So I am changing mine at the moment and I'm making the heart a little deeper and you can make it larger or smaller. And then you get the algebra which you're, I think, supposed to tweet out to your love. So this is a love that expresses uniqueness. <laughs> My unique love has just been captured in a formula. And it's very, very amazing. I'm going to express to you, my listener, my absolute adoration and gratitude, which I'm sure you will appreciate because it goes like this. X to the power of 2 plus 1 plus B times Y to the power of 2 plus Z to the power of 2 minus 1. And that whole part you need to do to the power of 3. Then minus X to the power of 2 times Z to the power of 3 minus A times Y to the power of 2 times Z to the power of 3. So, there. Now you know how much I appreciate you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Very Not Normal podcast with me, Frida Weisel. If you liked it, please consider spreading the word, liking, subscribing, sharing. You can also leave me feedback by going to my anchor.fm page. There is a link in the episode description of how to get to it. I'm also including in the episode description links to other sources I'm mentioning in the podcast so you can do your further deep dives. If you would like to, you can also check out my other work at freedomizel.com. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.